Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, 31st and last meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Can I ask everyone in the room to ensure their mobile phones are switched to silent? We, you can, of course, use them for social media, but please don't film or uh, record proceedings. We have apologies from Alec Cole Hamilton and Colin Smith. Uh, the first item on our agenda is subordinate legislation with two negative instruments to consider. The first is the Novel Foods Scotland Regulations 2017. Uh, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I invite any comments from members? No comments. Uh, has the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That's agreed, thank you. The second instrument is the sale of nicotine vapour products vending machine Scotland regulations 2017. Again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I have any comments from members? No, no comments. Uh, has the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That's agreed, thank you. Agenda item two is our um, inquiry on preventative agenda. Um, and this is the first of a series of one-off sessions um, that this session will look at type two diabetes. Can I welcome to the committee, uh, Brian Kennan, chair of the Scottish Diabetes Group and National Managed Clinical Network. Um, Andrew Job, Secretary of Edinburgh Lothian uh, Local Support Group with Diabetes Scotland, Linda McGlynn, Regional Engagement Manager, and Alison Coburn, who is a lead dia diabetes cardiovascular, uh, uh, lead, leads in diabetes car cardiovascular risk for NHS Lothian and is a pharmacist. Thank you all for attending this morning. We'll move direct to questions. Um, Sandra, would you like to begin? <coughs> thank you very much, convener, and good morning, panel. Thank you very much for coming coming along. Um, the papers we've got and uh, the general uh, information we have is obviously there's a number of issues which cause obesity, which are there for cause diabetes, uh, such as obviously being aware or obese, uh, a relative with type 2 diabetes, having high blood pressure or cholesterol levels. But I was interested in one of the areas that uh, came up in the papers in regards to environmental aspects of it. Uh, we've been given uh, evidence, a growing body of evidence, uh, in regarding obesity to diabetes is the rapid rise in exposure to a number of chemicals uh, in the air, soil or water. And I just wanted to ask members if they're aware of that, of any trials that's going on, and the information we've received, and uh, the risk factors, and how it might actually impact on the prevention of uh, obesity and all types of diabetes. Uh, if someone would like to open up. I don't know if you are aware of it, but I thought I'd throw it out there. I wouldn't profess any degree of expertise in that area in terms of associations and environmental factors. I mean, I think undoubtedly most of the trial evidence, particularly around interventions, have been about lifestyle issues, such as you've said, of weight and physical activity. I know there have been some weak associations, I mean, between environmental factors and type 2 diabetes, but they've never been proven to be necessarily causative. Um, and therefore, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been any randomised control trials looking at um, controlling for these variables. So certainly when we're thinking about the prevention of type 2 diabetes, then I think quite rightly the key areas that we would focus on would be diet and physical activity, um, because that's where the evidence base lies to date. I dare say this is an evolving field, and it may be that in years to come there'll be a stronger evidence base in which we might need to consider things like vitamin D exposure and things, because that's often associated with many different conditions, not just diabetes. But to date, there isn't firm evidence that that allows a, a scope for intervention. Okay. Anyone else on the panel want to come in on that particular one? With that, I think where, the, as uh, Brian said, there's very little, a lot of evidence, randomised trials. Where there might be some links is if there's an autoimmune response um, from the carcinogenic or from the environmental chemicals. We don't know what that autoimmune response might be. So it is an emerging field, and at the moment it's just a case we just have to keep an eye on that and look at research and see what the, what the results are. Could I just thank you. It's just the, the evidence that we've been given is through um, not just exposure through air, obviously as, as air pollution, but also exposure through ingestion, through obviously chemicals perhaps uh, in farming uh, or whatever, and uh, through the placenta. So you're saying that there's not been enough trials done or enough evidence to support these um, 
Yeah, I mean, again, I, I wouldn't claim any significant degree of expertise in this area, but like many conditions, I think you're right to highlight that in utero experiences, so during pregnancy, is there potential maternal exposure to environmental agents that could cause harm? then that's difficult to ascertain. We do know that certain drugs are associated with diabetes and increased risk of developing diabetes, like the use of steroids, certain HIV therapies and things like that. But they're more of a direct mechanism as to how they work. The side effect is then to increase your risk of developing diabetes rather than what you're obviously describing would be environmental exposure to, to carcinogens. So to, to the best of my knowledge, there just isn't a firm evidence base that one particular factor is causative as opposed to just associated with it. So I think I think it's an area of that needs further progress and work. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Ivan? Yeah, um, I was interested in um, understanding a bit about the, um, the, the causes and the, the risk factors and um, where the um, most of the cases are, are coming from and it looks to be that uh, weight control obesity is, is the single biggest issue. Um, so it's to understand how well that's understood because there's a lot of numbers thrown about about if we do if we can control that the amount of money that would save further downstream in the health service. So I don't know if you want to maybe just talk around about your understanding of, of that data, um, what, is, what what the biggest risk factors are and and how we, where we would save the money if we were managed to uh, to control control obesity. I think, and I'm speaking as a lay person in this respect, the link between weight and obesity and type 2 diabetes, in, in my mind, is very well proven. I'm a case where I was severely ob ob obese and going down a very slippery slope in terms of type 2 diabetes and the complications attached to it. I turned it around by losing a lot of weight and now I'm off medication. So effectively, I put myself into remission. Um, and based on that experience, I would say it is simply, it sounds terribly simple to say lifestyle. It's what you eat, how much you eat, and I think it's quantity as well as quality of food, and how much activity you do. For, um, it's a very simple equation in my mind. The calories you take in, you really should be spending. And if you're not spending it, you're going to put weight on. That puts pressure on various mechanisms inside your body and one of the consequences can be type 2 diabetes and all the complications then fall off of that or the increased risk factors that fall off of that. So it's quite simple but very complex. Uh, um, that sounds trite, I know, but um, weight and the risk of type 2 diabetes are associated. How you tackle the issues around people Gaining weight, not taking enough ex exercise, and so on, are very complex. Yes, yeah, so a simple relationship, but more difficult to influence. Yes. I mean, I was just going to pick up on that point from Andrew. Clearly, type two diabetes is is multifactorial. You have a genetic predisposition. Age is actually one of the biggest risk factors, so the older you get, the higher chance you've got of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, and we also know the ethnicity, so a lower body mass index than individuals from Southeast Asian um, communities will develop or be at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. I think for this committee, in terms of a preventative agenda, then it's effectively modifiable risk factors we should be looking at and I think as Andrew's an excellent case in point is that the biggest modifiable risk factor for us as a society would undoubtedly be obesity, weight and, and weight reduction. Got certain figures that say three out of five of cases of type 2 diabetes can be avoided um, and they're linked to um, obesity and being overweight. And, and if we can avoid those, that would be, um, you know, it's it's a proven fact. And the um, the prevention program in England is doing a lot of work on that, proving the um, the loss of weight and then putting the, the diabetes into remission. It not it's not only the outcomes in terms of fiscal outcomes for NHS. It's also in terms of quality of life outcomes for the person living with the condition. Um, and, and so all of those, the, the quality of life outcomes for people living with the condition are probably more difficult to quantify, but they're nevertheless as important. I just wanted to 
say about the comorbidities associated with type 2 diabetes and obviously my clinic where I see patients with um, cardiovascular disease, complications and renal impairment, these are like the, the more complex end of things but obviously can be prevented as well with um, pr the prevention strategy of um, encouraging patients to lose weight, exercise, etc. But in terms of targeting resource, I think it's really important to target patients who are in perhaps positions of greatest need, who have perhaps got the most complications and um, the poorest quality of life. And um, evidence has shown that although the um, preventative strategies in terms of weight loss and encouraging exercise at a population level are very useful, it's difficult to actually prove uh, to, to make substantial benefits compared to targeted individualised programmes. So, uh, and I fully understand, of course, it's very important for individuals concerned. They'll be saying it isn't, um, but there were plenty of discussion about that, but just focusing down on the, the, the fiscal aspect of it, um, where where do those costs manifest themselves? So what are the things that are expensive about treating diabetes? I mean, ultimately, what I'd like to get to, if anyone's able to cast any light on it, is the relationship between a £1,000 or a million pounds spent treating it and what you could do if you had money on the prevention side of things and, and how much that would save over a period of time. We, we know that um, one of the, the problems of someone who's got type 2, who's diagnosed with type 2, they potentially have had the, 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 the condition for several years before it's been picked up. During that time, there's been changes, so they're developing the complications such as um, problems with vision, potential problems with kidneys, potential problems with circulation. So... If you think that 80% of those complications could potentially um, are the ones that are spe we spend the most money on, and if someone's in hospital for um, related to a non-diabetic condition, they're likely to be in hospital about four to five days longer. Um, so the, you've got an extension of a stay which roughly will cost another £2,000 per person. And if you think there's probably about... 500,000 patients across a year with diabetes, then that's an awful lot of money. It's also around if you can prevent someone going on the medication, then considering what the, the pharmacological bill is for Scotland, if we can prevent some of the people having to go on to the medication, then you, your savings there. And then it's also savings in terms of um, going to more specialist services as well. So it's, it, it's across the board. Back to your comment about let's get this down to pounds and pence, then um, I mean, we know that 80% of the expenditure on type 2 diabetes is probably on complications, and some of those will undoubtedly be avoidable with early detection and indeed early intervention. Um, there was a recent big meta analysis that was just published last month in the British Medical Journal that was actually looking at the cost effectiveness of interventions. Um, and there's a real difficulty in distilling that data because it partly depends on the population that you're studying. So if you address high risk individuals who are at very high risk of developing diabetes, then your intervention will be much more cost effective than if you go for a potentially a population wide screening approach. But the meta analysis suggested that, uh, I mean, a quality, so quality adjusted life year worked out at about seven and a half thousand pounds for a lifestyle intervention program. And in the grand scheme of things, that, that's cost effective. There have been some studies that have suggested it's cost saving and others that have had qualities that are much higher than that. So it partly depends on the study, the, the population that you're studying, but undoubtedly there's a cost effectiveness to prevention agenda and initiatives that would lead to that. And, and that's true of lifestyle intervention and some relatively inexpensive pharmacological interventions with a drug called metformin. Okay, thank you. Brian, is it on this point? Is it, yes, okay. Uh, thanks, Camilla. Um, I, just, I sit on the, okay, I sit in the uh, cross party group for um, the diabetes, just to let you know. Um, if, if, we, if we extrapolate that, uh, Ivan McKee's point further than that, and we look at uh, prevention, because uh, what we're talking about here is, is, is sort of early intervention once they have contracted uh, diabetes or uh, that, that has manifested itself, how far back? Uh, can you can you trace diabetes to a, as an age? 
so so uh, uh, if we if we had uh, uh, children that uh, were more active, uh, or, or, or we could we could adopt their adapt their um, uh, sort of a, a relationship with food back then, how far back do we need to go? On reflection, I would say that I was showing symptoms of diabetes around about 12, 15 years before I was diagnosed. Um, and that was largely around, I used to play rugby, stopped playing rugby, didn't change, stopped doing exercise in any meaningful form because of various other factors. Um, and again, with in my own case, I feel it was me putting weight on and lack of um, activity that promoted me up the scale. I have a family history of diabetes, type 2 diabetes as well, which made me a bit more predisposed. But um, yes, I would say 10 to 15 years before I was diagnosed, I was showing symptoms of having diabetes. Um, and that obviously has in, builds up an effect inside me. I was just going to say that's where the screening comes in and that's you know really important to actually pick up the pre-diabetes um, state that people go through um, and that's a role that certainly community pharmacists are well placed for and um, you know and perhaps reaching the more um, deprived areas people who are less likely to engage with the health service routinely um, so to actually target um, perhaps resources that we already have in the com community better, um, such as the, the health centres, the pharmacies, etc., to actually implement screening so that you can pick up these people because it's so much more expensive to be chasing up after the event, you know, once they've contracted diabetes and, and have the complications, etc., etc., and apart from their quality of life being um, potentially um, much poorer and perhaps a shorter um, length of life as well. So... Mm -hmm. yeah, just pick up the, the cost effectiveness analysis I gave was actually for prevention of diabetes so this wasn't in cohorts who already had diabetes this was those who were identified as having pre-diabetes actually um, I think as a, as a Scottish diabetes community we should be very pleased that uh, Mike Lean who I don't think is given evidence in the next session but he was one of the, the lead authors and research that's just been published a week ago that shows about exactly what you were highlighting of early diabetes and being able to put it back into remission with a very intensive lifestyle intervention so I don't want to step on anybody's toes who's potentially in the next session talking about obesity but we're now getting increasing evidence that if we intervene early in a disease process so after type 2 diabetes has been diagnosed within, well this was six years, then with, with fairly significant lifestyle intervention you can actually put more and more cases back into remission. So I think there are areas of evidence where you can tackle in the pre-diabetes stage with high risk identification and then at the early onset of disease. But, but I think there is evidence around children and young people and there are policies out there about flourishing um, Glasgow which clearly recognises that Children in deprived areas need to have access to activities and healthy foods. Um, and if you don't have that legacy, then that legacy of that um, in childhood actually can manifest in, in adulthood as well. So that's why we say it's not, just, um, it's not just around the health service, it's around environment, it's around education. It, it's a, around actually giving people the skills to actually... Um, access healthy foods, know how to cook them, etc. And the sooner we can embed those skills and that knowledge in our young people, the better chance we have of them living longer, healthier lives. Yep. Um, that is actually where I'm really, what, I'm, what my real interest lies in, is that sort of access to that kind of opportunity, that learning opportunity. So it's, I think, you know, if I say following on from Ivan's, uh, Evan McKee's point, is this, if if we invest in that early, we, we can we know exactly where the deprived areas are. We knew, we know who are, have access to opportunity and who doesn't. If we focused um, uh, on those particular areas and we invested in those particular areas there, in terms of their relationship with food, in terms of you know as you understanding food, in terms of understanding physical exercise and getting access to physical exercise, has there been any studies done there that would that would indicate it's, it's, it's pre pre diabetes in fact. It's, 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 it's prevention right at the start. Are there any studies there that suggest how much um, that's worth to the nation in terms of in terms of health? I don't know of any in terms of that 
direct correlation, but certainly there are studies being done um, since the 1990s on that element of work, um, and I'm sure the Glasgow um, Glasgow Population for Health um, have got a lot of um, information on the just the importance of that health improvement aspects of things, that public health aspects of things, and actually doing things on the ground. So there are. There is evidence there, but I couldn't actually bring it directly to mind at the moment, but there is evidence out there. Can I ask, how, how much is diabetes, a, a, if you like, a class-based disease? Yeah, I mean, it, it's really important, I think, when we're having the discussion that we distinguish between type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune condition, which there is no avoidable factors. That's just something that you develop, and it's just luck effectively and um, whereas type 2 diabetes we know there's a significant lifestyle component we know there's a strong association between developing type 2 diabetes and deprivation of course these things are always complex because they go hand in hand in terms of deprivations associated with um, l less access to healthier food substances and um, less access to physical spaces in which to do exercise so it's complex but we definitely know that deprivation and type 2 diabetes go hand in hand. Extent, though? Um, I mean, not to the extent that weight would be a, a higher risk factor for it. So it's back to an association rather than definitely being causative. But within certain demographics, is the prevalence of diabetes much higher than in you know, wealthier communities, wealthier... Yeah, so, so the more deprived you are, the higher instance there is of type 2 diabetes. Uh, but it, is that sharp, that... Divergence. Um, I mean, there is a difficulty there because we know that obesity rates are higher in mm. more deprived areas than more affluent areas. We know that physical activity is less in those areas. So it's not a direct correlation in that regard because it's so many different confounding variables that could be contributing to that onset of that disease. So it's almost like they cohort and nest together rather than being like a dose-response curve that the less deprived you are, the less likely you have type 2 diabetes because I think there's too many different factors in there to, to, to piece that out. Emma? Thank you. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, before I ask my question, I need to say that I am the co-convener of the cross-party group for diabetes. I'm a registered nurse and I have type 1 diabetes myself. Um, and I think Henry VIII probably died of um, type 2 diabetes complications, actually. So it might not be just linked to a class or uh, how much money you have. So I read that somewhere down the line. Um, I'm interested in pre-screening and the pharmacy aspects of it. Um, and I know that GPs doing normal lab tests will pick up a high blood sugar, which might then lead to fasting, glucose testing. But if we are looking for uh, screening aspects, I am aware that Diabetes UK did a, a finger stick blood testing in Dumfries last year. So, you know, that way to target people who might be pre-diabetic or looking at age. Is there a, a way that we should be looking at pre-screening on a kind of national way like that? Um, as I said before, the, the community pharmacists are really ideally placed to, um, to perhaps not only screen potential people who might have diabetes, but also to uh, advise them and give them advice on taking their medication for those that, you know, they can see from their pres prescriptions that they are diabetic. Um, and also reinforcing exercise, healthy lifestyle, giving up smoking, all, all of the other um, linked factors. Um, certainly the, the main issue just now with the community pharmacists is that they don't have access to GP records. So for individual patients, you can't, as a community pharmacist, look up a patient's history and, you know, on the, the vision system that the GPs have. So it's very limited as to what they can do re-providing advice. And the other potential um, negative factor is their time because their main focus is on producing prescriptions, etc., dispensing. So that's kind of something that pulls away from being able to provide um, the service that they would like to. Um, and there's a number of pharmacists who work as integrated care pharmacists that actually um, provide the sort of interface between primary and secondary care. So we'll follow patients through on discharge um, to their, their uh, GP practices and then help at that 
point of view also with making sure that the medications are right and everything transfers smoothly. Um, so, so there's a number of opportunities there where I think things could be made more slick and better for patients, definitely. There used mm. to be a programme in Scotland which was Keep Well, which was a screening programme that targeted high-risk people over the age of 40 for um, not just diabetes but heart disease as well. Um, and it used um, screening tools and, and that worked quite well because it wasn't just the screening, it was the support afterwards for the person um, to be able to make those those changes, those behavioural changes. So screening's okay, it, it's a method of picking people up at high risk, but it's then what do you then do with them, how do you support them? And that is key to certainly the, the direct a study that Professor Lean and Professor that they've been doing, it's, it's not just about the diet and the obesity, it's around the support people are given for the psychological support um, to be able to make those changes and continue those changes. And certainly the, that element of support is very, very clear in some of the weight management programmes that are around across Scotland. We've got some good examples of that, where it's not just that clinical bit, it's that psychological, that support as well. So if we are doing screening, it is, is important that people are supported so they can make those changes mm -hmm. and not be left on their own. As you said, there used to be a screening programme. Uh, there, there used to be a programme called Keep to, Well. Keep Well. Um, well, it was only funded for a few years and then the funding was, um, a lot of the health boards didn't continue the funding. Mm -hmm. The funding came down from sec uh, central government mm -hmm. and then after a period of time, a lot of the that funding went centrally, mm -hmm. so some health boards kept it going under the, mm -hmm. the health improvement, but there's not many of them around now. And was there, was there evidence that that was <coughs> working? Yes, it was. It targeted a very specific uh, high-risk group, so it targeted over 45s, and it certainly worked within the deprived areas. They, are, they actually employ people to make sure that um, patients would turn up for their reviews, so there'd be somebody going round, you know, banging on their door saying, you've got an appointment, you better come, because that's one of the key issues. It's what we call the DNAs, the do not attends. I mean, in, in um, you know the hospital outpatient clinics, the diabetes clinics, it's about a forty percent DNA rate, mm. and that's patients with diabetes. You know, so. And was that? A, do you think that was a retrograde step? The mm. stopping the keep yeah. well. Well, it was definitely a program that, in its early stages, was showing a lot of promise. That was looking as though it was it was working, and it was really focusing yeah. on the more deprived populations. Um, so, unfortunately, yeah, it was just. Brian and then they might back in. No, just, say, just to, to sort of give an update as to where we're at with the Scottish Diabetes Group. So um, you'll hear from Alison Diamond next, who's chair of our short life working group. But we're very much trying to tackle this prevention agenda. And part of that will be identifying who are the high risk cohort that we should be screening. What screening should we be doing? Because there is a bit of debate as to which screening test should be used in the cohorts that you're identifying but as Linda's highlighted more importantly what do you then do about it and I think that's why this is opportune timing to have this discussion because with the ongoing review of the, the diet and obesity strategy then there's an opportunity to say if you identify high-risk people what can we actually do meaningfully as not just a health service but as a community and as a society to actually address that and either put people, avoid them developing type 2 diabetes in the first place or put them into remission if they're picked up early enough. So we are trying to get that joined up thinking. And I think historically weight management services have sat out with diabetes services and we're trying to promote that sort of codependency and, and, and thinking in that manner. Okay. I'll go with the managed clinical network uh, next because that was where my original, I guess, thoughts were. When we are you identify a really good practice in one health board so and that comes to the MCN or however you um, engage with that. I'm assuming that it gets disseminated across health boards so that they can look at who's doing good practice, how do we share it, how do we make sure everything's evidence-based and then um, how do we cost it in probably the most cost-effective way. So can you tell us a wee bit about what the MCN does? Yeah, I mean, diabetes managed clinical networks have been established for some time now, and, and we have got a good infrastructure as a, a single disease entity. I think in the area of the preventative agenda, then 
historically it's probably sat out with diabetes. It's been more in public health and weight management services, and that's what I mean by now we're trying to bring in that prevention agenda within the MCNs as well. Um, we have regular MCN leads meetings whereby we do try and disseminate and share good practice. In fact, we've got a national conference in February of next year, which will be about promoting good practice and seeing the progress against the improvement plan. Um, I'm not going to sit here and be idealistic and suggest that every board then picks up every initiative that's been shown to be effective, because undoubtedly a lot of successful initiatives have had funding to kickstart that process and get it established, and then it's then identifying, particularly within this current climate, where you can then identify that funding. And I think that's why there's an opportunity for us to think differently about how we utilise the resources that we have. And I think we need to think not just about how much extra staff do we need, what extra resource do we need, but how do we utilise what we already have to give the best impact from an evidence-based perspective. The other thing as well is, although we're very good at collecting data on diabetes, in the pre-diabetes stage, then the, the evidence gathering, and I think BC Action Scotland even said that in their statement about having robust outcomes from weight management is difficult. We're quite fortunate in diabetes that we've got a national IT system to capture that. is an, an, an ideal vehicle for um, diabetes prevention and diabetes improvement across the board, whether it's secondary uh, prevention or primary prevention. I think where there are some disconnect is that um, the, the primary care and the integration boards aren't really fully um, integrating with the managed clinical networks. Um, I attend every single... Um, managed clinical network across Scotland. Um, there are some very, very committed clinical staff on there. But in terms of actually having support from primary care in some of those health board areas, it's not that great. So strategically, we're not joining up as well as we could. And if we could get that joined up, I think we could make huge, huge inroads into prevention. And as Brian said, the opportunity we have now with the, the prevention subgroup and the work with the, the obesity consultation, that gives us um, a really good opportunity to work together across the diabetes communities. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Alison? Um, thank you. There... <sighs> I think some of the written submissions suggest that there is a focus on treatment rather than prevention, um, even though there's evidence to suggest that lifestyle changes might have longer incomes, uh, outcomes, better long-lasting outcomes than purely medical ones. And the Diabetes Scotland Edinburgh group suggests that health boards don't prioritise support to non-clinical interventions. And Diabetes Scotland state there is a weighted bias towards secondary care at health board level and that prevention hasn't been addressed in a strategic way. Um, sounds like this is something that we need to change and I just wonder what role, um, you know, how successful are your own interventions in, in changing that direction? Because it's obviously very expensive. I think there's um, the opportunity for the, when the integration of health and social care came on board, that was an, an ideal opportunity to start doing some more joined up work together. To, um, and I think we have got some good examples across Scotland where secondary care, integration, primary care are all working together to, for the prevention agenda. Um, I think it's just historically the, um, a lot of the clinical leads for diabetes across um, Scotland have been clinicians, secondary care clinicians, where we've had a GP who's a primary care lead or a joint lead, then we know we're getting buy-in from um, primary care and everyone and other levels of the health board. So I think it's about everybody recognising that prevention is not just, um, and diabetes is not just a secondary care issue, it's a primary care issue, and prevention is everyone's issue, and, and I think we need to start that dialogue. We have to start that dialogue, otherwise we're going to open the floodgates and we're not going to be able to cope. Yeah, I'd just like to re uh, reinforce that. Um, the point I think I was trying to make was that there is this disjointed or disjointed uh, situation between primary care and secondary care in terms of how the patient is looked at. I'm 
looked after by my GP. And really, sometimes it's like you're just they're ticking boxes and left alone. So, are they? If you're picked up, how do you get picked up? What is the pathway that you, is expected to uh, be followed? And again, that, there seems to be great variation in that. And uh, as um, Linda said, um, we're quite fortunate, I think, in Lothian, insofar as we do have a joint uh, primary care lead in our MCN. So it's probably better engagement with the GP community. But there is still this disjointed thing. They're not looking to prevent, they're looking to manage a lot of the time. Um, Just to pick up on that, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why, as a Scottish diabetes group, we are trying to push forward this agenda of taking it pre-diabetes into diabetes so that we do start to get more of that joined-up approach. Personally, I'd rather we got rid of the terms primary and secondary care because I think it's an artificial divide. It should be community-based services and acute-based services and that that specialist resource if it's a specialist consultant resource or a diabetes specialist nurse or a dietitian, should be able to offer support in a community setting as well as an acute setting. And that's the sort of rhetoric that we're trying to promote across diabetes services and indeed probably all long-term conditions. It shouldn't be based on your geographical site, but more the expertise that you can bring to that pathway. And I think that's key, and I think all of us agree this. It's clarity about the clinical pathway that we're trying to promote and therefore the interventions that you would expect at any given point on the pathway. And to date, there are pockets of good practice, but it's how do we standardise that and how do we ensure that, that, that we're, we're trying to get a universal approach to that. Just quite be interested in the, the, the pharmaceutical, you know, your own view on what role you can play in tackling this. Yeah, I think um, there's been a number of initiatives with um, community pharmacists we're running clinics in um, community pharmacies where they've actually been able to help the patients manage their medications and also help provide advice when they've been um, admitted to hospital for whatever reason and then they come out again, etc. Um, I think that it's very um, piecemeal, however. These these clinics are not, they're not, you know, uh, per head of the population pro rata or, you know, th there's not really many of them, so they're like centres of excellence. Um, and then the patients in the acute sector, um, they, they are seen by perhaps pharmacists on discharge and medications, what we call medicines reconciliation processes are put into place to make sure that their medicines are correct on discharge but then they go back to their GP practice and may not actually see anybody else who reviews their therapy until their next GP appointment. So there's, there's quite a few gaps in the system for if you follow patients through on their journey from primary to secondary care and then secondary care back to primary care. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of opportunities where I think things could be improved significantly for patients to make sure that we don't actually get medication errors occurring um, or that complications are developing that aren't picked up at, at an early enough stage. Can I ask one further question? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we'd been sitting here a few decades ago, we wouldn't have been looking at the stats we're looking at now. Obviously, this is a, a global epidemic, and Scotland, unfortunately, is, you know, we're leading in areas that we don't want to lead on. Now, the government are looking at their diet and obesity strategy. Um, I just wondered if there's any particular you know, route that you'd like to see them go down? Is it about tackling supermarkets? Is it about reducing, you know, deals that people in Scotland seem to be particularly susceptible to? You know, we have incredibly high figures for for being suckered in by by these deals to buy junk food. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if there's one thing the government are introducing in that strategy, what you would like it to, to be? I think it, it's that whole um, gambit of unhealthy foods, the advertising for un unhealthy foods, it's the processed foods and um, the levels of sugar, etc. in the processed foods. Um, it's that a whole gambit of issues that need to be to need to be looked at. Um, it's also around fuel poverty um, and and around you know poverty of access to. Um, to physical activity, to green spaces. So it's, it's 
as Brian alluded to earlier on, there's a whole fiscal policy around there, around environmental issues, around food issues that need to be tackled. And I think the, the obesity strategy just tried to do some of that in its consultation. Thank you. The one thing, actually, from the strategy is the fact that it is multi-level. And we know there are some countries who are going down a route of just screen and treat high-risk individuals with diabetes. Other um, countries like Finland are going at a population level as well as a high-risk level. And, and I think what the strategy allows us to do is to tackle at a population level, so a primary prevention of obesity. But there's also that secondary prevention of once you've developed obesity to try and stop you from developing type 2 diabetes. So I think the one thing is actually it is multi-level and it is a population approach as well as a, um, an individual approach, which I think we need. Thank you. At, at this committee, we hear a lot of people saying, we've got a good strategy. We've got a good report. We all need to work together. I mean, great, terrific. But what I'm not hearing today is we're supposed to be looking at the preventative agenda. So what systematic, practical steps are being taken today to prevent people from getting type 2 diabetes? What can you point to that's happening in a systematic way across the country that says this is preventative work that will stop someone uh, getting the disease? Okay, so just now, NHS Scotland, we've got 14 boards and they are do, they have got different practices. Some practices are excellent with weight management services. Some so are, who, some who's are, doing good work and what are they doing? And who's doing not so good work and what are they not doing? Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to go down the route of the not the good work. There are areas Why? like Lothian and Glasgow. Well, no, because, I mean, I'm here as a diabetologist. I'm not here as a Glasgow, as a weight management service. So that would be out with my remit. I suppose what we've had today is a disjointed service between weight management and diabetes. What I've tried to reiterate today, and you're talking about hard facts, what's actually happening. What's happening on the ground is we've got a short life working group that's pulling together the expertise from public health, weight management, obesity experts, diabetes, dietetics, pharmacy. We're getting them together. And with that strategy, we'll pull out pockets of good practice. What is already happening is... Surely we've, we've got, done that before, though. Well, we've got an opportunity for us to standardise an approach. And the MCN structure within diabetes allows us that um, any intervention can be rolled out more readily. I mean, there have been good examples of when we've had, for example, if, I, if I'd sat here two years ago and I talked about type one education, there were pockets of good practice. We actually took that good practice and we made it into a national initiative. And that national initiative has now been rolled out across Scotland so that everybody with type 1 diabetes at diagnosis will get a similar education package and we can determine their outcomes because we'll have hard evidence. And that's the route we're trying to get down with type 2 diabetes and diabetes prevention. I'll not lie, I think it is challenging between the changes in the primary care environment with the IGBs that um, Linda's alluded to and about diabetes and single disease entities within getting in within that environment. But we have got an opportunity now with the current policy that's under review about us establishing a firm clinical pathway and with that hard outcomes. And the advantage in diabetes are we have got that ability to detect those hard outcomes, monitor those hard outcomes and see where, it, it, where it's effective or not. And I think that's been the problem today. How do you define success? And, and that's been challenging. But what you've referred to is after diagnosis. Um, no, because I think we can extend it back to the pre-diabetes. So we already have a register of people with impaired glucose tolerance, with impaired fasting glucose, with gestational diabetes. We should be utilising that data set to allow us to look at the outcomes from them more readily. Um, I mean, Brian asked earlier about are we picking up people when they've had diabetes for a number of years? Well, big landmark studies showed that 50% of people with type 2 diabetes at diagnosis had complications. We know that that's changed. We know that that figure is getting less and less, so suggesting we're picking up that disease earlier. Um, I mean, to be honest, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that I think we're beginning to get several different things in place that will allow us to do this properly and in a, in a standardised approach across Scotland. I think the answer to question is the moment at the moment no we're not doing it there's not a consistent approach at the moment what brian's talking about is something that diabetes scotland are really really supportive of doing um and it's a piece of work that we need support for but at the moment um it's just in the early stages but there's no consistent approach at the moment across the 14 health boards 
Sandra, did you want to know on this point? It was just, it was just, a, a, it may be controversial. I don't think it is though, because you've mentioned about the fact people working together. Uh, my thoughts when I've listened to the evidence is, do you think there's a degree of protectionism in, in certain aspects of the health service, such as secondary, uh, primary, not wanting, you know, basically to let go, as you might say, to bring things into a more community level? Yeah. Um, so ultimately, in diabetes, actually, we've. <laughs> that protectionism has gone, whether it by necessity or design, and that most type 2 diabetes care is looked after in primary care now. And actually, we're trying to get a more dynamic interface with secondary care clinicians for more challenging cases with type 2 diabetes. In Scotland, certainly type 1 diabetes is still the remit of secondary care. Mm -hmm. So I can understand where you're coming from. I dare say there is a degree of protectionism in any of us in all our environments. But I think in diabetes and NHS Scotland, no. I mean, I think the challenge is actually to take this discussion out with the NHS because this is a societal issue. Type 2 diabetes prevention, obesity strategy, this is a societal issue. This isn't about a primary care group of clinicians, a secondary care group of clinicians, and a third sector organisation who are going to solve this. And I think that's why the early years initiatives and all these things that have been talked about are most welcome. I think one, of the, one of the key things is, I'm not quite sure it's protectionism, mm -hmm. as you say. I think some of it's around lack of understanding and a lack of awareness and, and lack of realisation of the urgency of this. Um, and I think one of the key things, as Alison alluded to earlier on, was if you can prevent people developing type 2 um, and you can prevent uh, some of the complications of type 2, such as heart disease, etc., um, we're going to have a, a, hum a huge impact. So I think it's not protectionism, certainly because my experience of the managed clinical networks is when we have primary care staff involved, um, the partnership works really, really well because people are there to improve care for people with um, diabetes. Where there is, it's a lack of awareness, a lack of understanding, and maybe um, diabetes is not high up on the agenda of some of the integration boards. Mm -hmm. Is it on this point? Yes, it is. If it's on um, this point, very briefly, because yeah. we need to move on. It's just uh, taking up, uh, if I take you know, uh, Linda's point and Brian's point further than that, are we talking then about uh, an educational intervention or a health intervention here? It's easy, both. <laughs> well, in that, in the, so in that, case, in that case, then, we need to get out of it, put words in your mouth, get out of these silos of a health budget and an education budget then. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a societal issue that we should be having societal um, addressing it. And, and that's why I think when we start looking at the, the proposed strategy, then we have got transport in there, we have got active living in there, we have got diet and exercise, marketing, etc. as well as just healthcare services. What we found uh, sorry. The, the, the programme in England is that um, when people are in, on the programme in England, which is around group work, around... Um, prevention, diet and exercise and everything. Education, learning. So rather than calling it education, it's, it's skills development and knowledge development. And that skills development, knowledge of development and awareness of diabetes, both for the people at risk, for the person who's living with the condition and for the wider community is a thing that will help us tackle the stigma, the lack of awareness and maybe help us turn the corner. Okay, Ash. Um, Mr. Ken, I was quite interested when you were speaking earlier about different countries and you mentioned Finland. So obviously we've been talking this morning about if you're um, spending money um, and you're spending money you know, on prevention activities that in Scotland, you know, it'd be good to target high risk individuals, which we're doing. But that balance between then things like national health campaigns, obviously Brian's just been speaking there about education, but getting into other issues like things like food labelling, um, things like fast food outlets, you know, really near to schools. Um, food advertising on television that's targeted to children and so on. So I'm interested in the panel's view of where's the balance here between um, sort of medical intervention into high-risk individuals kind of on one hand and then the sort of wider societal issues that we've been speaking about on the other. Is it kind of a 50-50 approach or 70-30? Where, where would you see that? That's a hard one to so it depends whether you've been short-termist or long-termist. Um, I suppose so I'm, I'm thinking about very early prevention. You know, if we're talking about being overweight as being a, um, you know, a factor, if we can address that earlier in people's lives, then presumably that will have a knock-on effect. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's true. I mean, uh, recent evidence suggests that, what is it, 50% of your weight gain is by the age of seven or something like that. So undoubtedly, the early years are important. Um, if you had to say to me, here's your budget, how much would you give for both? Then off the top of my head, I'd probably go 50-50 because I think, I, I think as soon as we start placing undue importance on one area, mm. you've got the potential to lose the whole system approach. And I think ultimately, it's the whole system approach as a diabetologist, I should be sitting here saying, I'll take 100% of that for early type 2 diabetes, and it should all go into the direct study that's recently published, Great Remission Rates for Diabetes. That's once people have already got... Diabetes. Exactly. Yeah. But if we're looking at this as a sort of longer-term view for Scotland, mm. then I think you have to have equal investment in both. Okay. And I'm just wondering, in countries where there are other countries that are, have got good um, practice on this, you know, how are, how are they splitting up the, the spending? Do we know? Got any information on that? No. I mean, what would say is there's no country that's doing well on this because actually okay. this is a pandemic that's increasing, right. increasing, increasing. Okay. But I think there's an increase in recognition across the international diabetes community that diabetes in silo can't just worry about it once you develop diabetes. Yeah. We have to take a lead in preventative measures as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, do we need to follow what's happening in England in terms of the prevention program? Do we need to follow what's happening in England in terms of the prevention programme? The prevention programme in England is doing quite well. Um, <coughs> there was a substantial amount of money put into it. Um, the eight pilots showed quite a lot of um, improvement in terms of people losing weight and maintaining it. Um, and so there'll be another review of the, our report for the programme in April. But you can find out all the uh, evidence so far from it on the Diabetes UK website. And is there, do you have a view on it, whether that's what we should be taking up here? Personally, I think, um, yes, I think we should. I think there should be invest, uh, investment in these um, prevention programmes. Um, but I think they the need to be community-based. They need to be multifaceted. And they need to involve... Um, a range of um, individuals from healthcare professionals, health psychologists, third sector, peer support. So it has to be a partnership approach. Um, and if you look at what's happening in the borders in terms of their prevention programme, that's very much um, an example of a model that is trying to be expanded in the borders. And, and hopefully we will get some um, good evidence from that over the next five years. Any other comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I've got to say, I think we should learn from good practice wherever it is in the world. I don't think that the English Diabetes Prevention Programme in isolation is a model that we should be adopting wholesale. And, and I say that because if you only have a strategy that identifies high-risk individuals, screens them and intervenes, then I think you're missing the opportunities at a population level. So there are some aspects of that that I think we could look to mirror. I think there are intention of trying to standardise the intervention that they're offering is, is worthwhile. Um, but I think we have an opportunity to go further than that and look at it more at a population level as well as just that high risk level. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, Miles? Um, thank you, Convener. I wanted to develop two points which um, the panel's touched on already this morning. Firstly, for someone who has type 2, um, to what extent across Scotland are they having an, at least an annual review um, to see whether or not they should be on medication or whether or not they could um, be supported to come off that. And then secondly, um, one of the m members of the panel touched on the BME community and levels of prevalence. What work is currently taking place in Scotland to focus specifically on them and potential language barriers as well around diabetes? In terms of the first point, um, a minimum is an annual checkup, but ideally I think it should be six monthly. And but around that, there's always the constraints of resources, timing, availability, and, and, and so on. But it has to be a minimum of 12 months. Um, it really depends on the individual, from what I understand, and where they are in terms of improving, stable, or um, deteriorating. And is everyone in Lothian, you believe, receiving that? I believe so. There's variation across the country in terms of um, the the standard of how many people with type 2 are getting all the, the nine care processes and the 
annual review. I think as a whole, Brian, you might have the exact figure of what Scotland is as a whole. Um, but in terms of there is variation, there are some very good pockets where um, people are getting the re annual review. Lothian is one of the good examples. Glasgow is one of the good examples. Um, and it's it's about giving that, getting that back up. What you have to realise as well is within the terms of the annual review, we do have a lot of people who just don't turn up for it. So we will always have... DNA rates, um, th but it is it is patchy, but it's certainly improving, and it could certainly improve. Mm. Yeah, it is a minimum, though, isn't it? It's just it's like the lowest okay. common denominator, and it's just it is really a kind of tick box e box exercise. Check, you know, HB one C blood pressure, etc. So the the nine measures that the MCNs look at individually in each board assess all of these areas um, and for example the blood pressure one um, which is really key to my interest um, is really a kind of population level blood pressure it's not your ideal for diabetics because you know we, we would really struggle to to reach that so so it's kind of like there are broad brush indicators of the diabetic population in a board We've got the annual Scottish Diabetes Survey, which gives you data for each of the boards and their performance against these nine measures. I think, actually, we've been able to collect data for a long time in diabetes, and I've said that repeatedly. Actually, the, the, what we, the key now is how do you turn that data into improvements in care? And that's why we've introduced over the last two years MCN quarterly reportings, whereby each MCN and each board get their performance against 12 measures. And the hope is that the board and the MCN take ownership of two or three areas that they can introduce health improvement and drive that. So it's not just a matter of ticking the box and saying, oh, well, we've collected the data, but what are you going to do with that data to drive forward improvements? And that's one of the key areas that we're working on in the Scottish Diabetes Group, because we are cognizant that there are lots of reasons why it's not 100% and not everybody's getting it. Um, and we need to identify that and work it on. And in terms of the BME, then as um, MCN lead for GG and C, then we have a specific uh, health quality of access group that have tackled some BME issues. They tend to be quite standalone specific projects. Personally, I've got a, um, when we talk about quality of access, I think deprivation actually in Glasgow, the hardest to reach communities aren't necessarily just BME, but it's actually deprived areas as well. And there's some work to try and address that. But I, I wouldn't pretend that any of that's easy and it, it's not challenging. Thank you. Uh, MDL, would like to come in on any issues just before we finish up? Jenny. Thank you, Convener. Um, Ash Denham alluded to the, the split between health and education on this, and I think Brian Whittle picked up on it too. So I just wanted to ask specifically, uh, Linda McGlynn and, and Andrew Job, actually, in your submission, you recommend making education available in schools to teach about nutrition so they leave school with the appropriate knowledge to prepare and recognise healthy food. I thought that was already happening in schools. Um, to your knowledge, is it not happening? And do you as an organisation ever work directly with schools themselves? If it is happening, we don't see much of it coming through at the other end. Yeah. Um, I don't know about... Um, uh, in terms of we, what we do as a local group, we do talk occasionally to uh, school groups, but it's not a regular thing. It's not mm -hmm. organised in any shape or form. It really depends if we're invited in. Um, and what we have started, or I've started to do, is working with employers so we're getting in and talking to groups of employers i was recently down at haddington talking to the uh company that was is building rebuilding the hospital there mm -hmm. we had all their contractors in and we had two or three very good sessions in terms of education about food um and the balance between food and exercise and so on and healthy living but there is no um we are not involved in any structured or organized program but I do believe education, being able to make, have the knowledge to make the choices is really fundamental to improving uh, our lifestyle. Well, we do go in and um, talk to schools. Again, it's, um, it's an ad hoc basis based mm -hmm. on the invite coming from the school to go in um, and talk to them about diabetes, talk to them about um, 
the need for healthy eating, etc. Um, we did uh, have a program a few years ago, which was um, we actually went into school. We had a joint program with the um, science festival, and we went in and and we did six week program with schools in deprived areas. Mm -hmm. It was called Live for It. Um, and it was around looking at raising awareness about diabetes. It was around awareness about healthy eating, etc. Um, and that was aimed at um, schools in primarily deprived areas. Mm -hmm. And we did quite a few up and down the country. Um, and we did that for a while. But unfortunately, due to funding, that program stopped. But um, so it's, we do go into schools. Um, and I think one of the things that seems to t seems to happen is. Um, I think the children in, in secondary school will have home economics up until first or second year, and it's mandatory after that. They don't do any more. Uh, and I, I think there's a wee little bit to be said around keeping that those core skills in the curriculum. Yeah, I think, um, in my personal experience, it's not mandated that they're not allowed to take it. They can choose to take it at the end of SC, in my experience, uh, formerly as a teacher. Um, with regard to the funding issue, though, that you flagged up there, obviously through the Pupil Equity Fund that's been given to head teachers, head teachers now have a lot more power in terms of what they can spend their money on. Um, do you, as an organisation, therefore see an opportunity for Diabetes Scotland to create perhaps a pack of materials or to look at what you do as an organisation and to perhaps bid for some of that funding that's available to head teachers now? Well, we have a few uh, resources and information al already. We have a, um, a programme called Making the Grade, which is around um, looking at how children are looked after in school with diabetes. Within that, it, it looks at different elements of managing diabetes and it looks at healthy foods. So at the moment, I would say it's probably not something we've considered, but I'm not, I wouldn't rule it out. But we yeah. certainly do have resources um, that are available to schools already that they can have access to. Can I ask if those resources are linked to the curriculum content in Curriculum for Excellence and the Health and Wellbeing curriculum area, which already sits there? The making the grade is, yeah. but not, the, not our general packs. Our general okay. packs are around just giving people advice on diabetes. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Two, two final things before we go. Um, when is the um, report from the working group due to be published and when is the strategy uh, due to be published? So, Alice and Diamond, I think, is up next in the next group of sessions. She's chairing that group, so maybe oh, we'll leave give it a bit of updates of that. Yeah. That's okay. called passing the buck. Yes. <laughs> Very skillfully done. Yeah. Um, and finally, uh, Professor uh, Lean couldn't attend this uh, session because he's in South Africa for a conference, but his co-author will be on the next uh, panel, so we'll uh, hear from them then. Uh, okay, thank you very much for uh, your evidence this morning, and we'll now suspend briefly to change the panel.
Okay, we continue with our session on the preventative agenda, looking at uh, type 2 diabetes. Can I welcome to the committee uh, Dr Lynn Douglas, Steering Group Member, Obesity Action Scotland and Director of Allied Health Professionals, NHS Lothian. Uh, and from NHS Lothian, sorry. Pete Ritchie, Co-Convener, Scottish Food Coalition and Director, Norwich Scotland. Heather Peace, Head of Public Health and Nutrition Food Standards Scotland. Uh, Professor Falco Stihota, uh, Professor of Behavioural Medicine and uh, Psychology at um, Newcastle University. And Alison Diamond, Chair of Prevention Subgroup, Scottish Diabetes Group and Lead, uh, Lothian, uh, Lead and Lothian Weight Management Service, Diabetes and Metabolic Dietitian, NHS Lothian. It's a big title. Big title. Uh, okay, can we move to opening questions? Sandra, do you want to open up again? Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. In, in regards to prevention, I did ask the previous panel about the environmental aspects of it. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that particular one, but one of the about the causes, one of the other issues which is raised previously as well, uh, is regard to fast food outlets, unhealthy food, poverty. It's a huge list of them. So, first of all, obviously, ra regarding the causes and prevention, would you say that there is evidence there that could say that there is environmental aspects of carcinogenics, which causes obesity, therefore causes, um, obviously, diabetes? And the second question for me, uh, convener, is uh, regarding, obviously, the fast food outlets and what we can do with, obviously, we don't have the powers over certain areas to stop uh, you know, sugar going into foods. If there's any comments you'd like to make on whatever one you want to pick up in, <laughs> leave it to yourselves. Okay. Hi. Yes, I'm happy to pick that up. From environmental, I take it that you mean the food environment in which we. Well, there is. We were given evidence uh, in regards to the fact that uh, heavy metals in the air, oh. pollution, that type of thing although the previous panel had said that there wasn't that much evidence in regards to that. So I don't know if you feel no, sorry, I can't enough to pick up. answer on that one. So, so the other question yeah. would be, obviously, in regards to yes. fast food, fats, yes. sugars, yes. how do we prevent, particularly uh, younger kids, to, for the prevention strategy of accessing this? And my mind goes back to many years ago trying to, to campaigning to get these fast food vans taken away from outside schools, which we found very difficult to do, and we still can't always do it. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on, on that particular issue. Yes, I'd be happy to pick up the second point. I don't have any evidence on he heavy metals, I'm afraid. Um, my uh, this, The second point is more around the food environment that we, we all kind of uh, navigate and buy and consume our food. And the... Our view in Food Standards Scotland and the view of the board is that education on one hand is really very important. We don't deny that. We do a lot on the education front. But actually to move things forward towards healthier eating, we do need to see changes in the food environment. And that may be in what we call the out-of-home environment, which is where we purchase food and consume it outside the home. So that takes you into the takeaways and, and that whole arena. It's, it's quite a complex area. It's one that Food Standards Scotland has done some work on and has published uh, information describing that landscape in Scotland, and we've made proposals as to how that may change. Uh, as part of the current um, Scottish Government consultation on obesity, then uh, there is a part in there that talks about developing an out-of-home strategy for Scotland which at one time you might have called that a catering strategy, but actually out of home also encompasses um, supermarkets that sell food on the go. So it's from that right up to the high end and all the stuff in between the takeaways, etc. So we absolutely recognise that this is an area that needs to be tackled, that it's a part of the diet that's expanding, that people are eating more in this way and that we do need to get a handle on it and we will be moving forward to develop a and I think Food Standards Scotland will take a lead with with partners to start to develop a strategy that may help to address, and we'd hope to help to address, th that out-of-home environment in Scotland. Thank you. Um, Obesity Action Scotland recognise that the crisis within our, our weight um, within Scotland is 
um, highly attributed to the obesogenic environment, which is the second part of your question, and therefore um, is looking to ensure that we do have a significant contribution to the out-of-home strategy and also to, for example, regulate and control portion sizes and um, take on board issues such as regulation um, of price promotion to tackle obesity with regard to high calorie food, which is a key, obviously, impact in terms of that obesogenic environment. Um, and also the soft drinks uh, levy in terms of reducing the likelihood of individuals wanting to buy these, these foods and drinks, which we think is an important part of the strategy that's out for current consultation. It's important to emphasize that there's overwhelming evidence for the link between type 2 diabetes and both geographic and socioeconomic factors, and the two of them go together. Scotland has got one of the best statistics for neighborhood level levels of multiple deprivation, and you can use those quite easily, and you can have a very impressive mapping of the relationship between those. And it's important to look into geography and environment and socioeconomic status in conjunction and understand where the pockets are where geographic risk is particularly high, and some of the policies that were pr proposed, they have a good evidence base, they are easily available, and they are feasible and have been used elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, Food Coalition want to concur with that, and to point out that the last edition of the FTSE 100 index is Just Eat, right? So which doesn't have any outlets and doesn't make any products. What it does is get you to your pizza quicker. Right. So that whole, since 2008, the number of fast food outlets in the UK have, has risen by around 50%. We've got an industry which needs to sell more. We've got a more or less static population in Scotland, and we need, and every industry is on a growth curve. So something's got to give, and what's giving at the moment is our health. And that's not just in Scotland, it's globally. You know, we've got an industry that's trying to, you know, it's got perfectly legitimate growth targets, but we can only eat so much and stay well. You know, and, and something's got to give. And then the quality of what we're eating is changing and has changed significantly. So I think, in our view, it's not just the calories, it's the degree of processing in food, and it's also the lack of fibre in food. So the World Health Organisation recommends at least 20 grams of fibre a day. Food Standard Scotland recommends 30 grams of fibre a day. We're coming in under 12 grams of fibre a day. And that has significant impacts on our health and is linked to the incidence of type 2 diabetes. Can I just... Thank you. I just wanted to follow up, and it was one of the issues that the convener raised in the previous panel as well, in regards to poverty, uh, obviously areas of deprivation, poverty, where um, diabetes it seemed to be would be much much more diabetes there and more affluent areas. And I just wonder what your thoughts are on there, because I'm thinking about the fact about you know you're eating more processed foods. So would you look to um, a strategy that would target certain areas, as we've got the de deprivation pointers there. Would you look to a strategy that would target certain areas? Do you think it's more prevalent in, in areas of deprivation that diabetes would come about rather than more affluent areas? Could I just add to that? Well, in your Sorry. answer, and is there any evidence at the moment of resources being directed to target those communities in very practical ways? Well, I suppose from our point of view, absolutely, um, people on lower incomes have worse diets, and that's not because of a lack of education, it's because of a lack of finance. And if you look at the, you know, per calorie, you know, carrots are three times more expensive than, than processed food, they just are, you know, so although we may think that food is cheap, and it's cheaper in historical terms, than it has been for people who are trying to manage on a, a fixed and constrained diet uh, budget then the cost of good food is prohibitive. And that's a fact. Lots of people find they can't afford to eat the food they know they want to eat. Um, and we don't have a systematic approach at the moment in Scotland for rebalancing that. We have free school meals, which is a bit of a help. We have Healthy Start, which we're trying to revamp a little bit at the moment, which is a very small scheme. But at population level, the last time we balanced the diet was during the Second World War. And that was the last time we saw major in increases in, 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 in you know, equality, equalization of public health outcomes. Yeah. Uh, just to say a little bit about the Scottish diet, which we have been tracking for quite a long time to see what the changes are. And really, there are very few changes over about 20 years that stuck. 
I think in terms of uh, inequalities in that we see that across the whole population, I think everybody, whoever they are, are is eating too much fat, too much sugar, too much salt. So those sort of less healthy or the unhealthy parts of the diet, we're all equally consuming. It may be in different forms. It may be that somebody's going to buy their saturated fat in a cheap form or sugar in a cheap form, or some of the rest of us may be going off and buying it in a fancier form. But the nutrient profile is the same. Where we do see the difference is in those foods that are perhaps more protective to health. So Pete is absolutely right. We see lower fruit and vegetable consumption in, in, in lower socioeconomic groups. We see a woeful amount of vegetable consumption in children in Scotland, particularly Particularly. We see less oil-rich fish being consumed in lower socioeconomic groups and less fibre and uh, whole grains. So, you know, across the piece, we, have, we all have problems, but I think, and we haven't done the work in this, it, really the costing of, of that diet, but I can quite see why those more health-enhancing parts of the diet may be more expensive and, more, and less accessible in that sense to the... Uh, yes, it was also just to add that in terms of the children's weight screening, we know that the children who are in the most deprived areas have the highest incidence of obesity and overweight. And currently, in 2015, the population at the primary one stage was that 22% of children accessing primary one have or are at risk of obesity or indeed being overweight. So there is a link and there's an evidence base around the social economic impact. Huge. Alison, yeah. I'm just going to say as part of the prevention strategy, we're trying to work with the across health and social care and actually deliver services through local council and leisure venues, which incorporate healthy eating, access to self-esteem, mental health side of things, as well as the physical activity. So certainly we're trying to take the services to the community because access and being able to get to areas of service is, can be an issue as well in the lower income areas and the deprivation areas. We're also trying to work with the kind of social planning and even things like when there's licenses for fast foods, come, it's almost like trying to ensure that there's a, a cap put on how many venues are within areas. So trying to kind of work across the kind of health and social care agenda. Um, we have looked at different areas across Scotland, examples of good practice, and we are trying to bring it together to try and develop a framework that will suggest what is good practice and offer practical guidance on how we could implement it. Can I say, I've not heard really a single policy that people know of that is deliberately targeting resource at areas of deprivation. It might be that you just don't know, but I asked for examples and I'm not really getting them. So I can give you an example of Midlothian in Lothian, because I am lead for the weight management service in Midlothian. We've been trying to implement the prevention because Midlothian is quite a small board and we have in terms of the health and social care integration, we've met probably four or five times. We've had events, we've worked with the schools, we've worked with social planning, and we are trying to create a pathway of a kind of one-stop shop for this to try and ensure that it is being seen as being kind of joined up and developed together. Um, and again, in terms of the, the big thing in delivering these types of prevention programmes is the finance aspect of it. And Midlothian have made, as part of their implementation joint board that actually that's the area that they're going to focus monies on so we've actually as a, as a group in Midlothian decided which services we'll provide and made that be a priority. Okay, uh, yes Heather? The challenge around is there anything happening, policies around inequalities, I think the one, one does spring to mind that Scottish Government um, sponsor which is the Scottish Grocer Federation and uh, this is an initiative in um, small convenience stores where the, um, mainly in more deprived areas where the fruit and vegetables are put to the front and uh, there's encouragement to do that there. So that is one that springs to mind. Well, activity would probably be another thing in that the council areas are providing free or classes or access to gym etc for a pound so they're actually making physical activity more accessible and more economical. Pete? Yeah I mean 20 years ago we set up the Scottish Diet Action Plan 1996 um, and since then there's been funding for community food organisations. Um, it's been piecemeal, it's been small, 
lots of those organizations struggle year to year to actually get budget and they do very good work within their own communities to try and improve access to, to fruit and veg and healthy cooking and you know they operate at the community level but I think it's very small scale compared to the scale of the problem that we're actually facing. And many have closed due to local government cutbacks in my, they're in my always, area. In particular. Yeah, they're always scraping around. Yeah. So, Perhaps two slightly different examples. So there is in Edinburgh is um, the Pedroza um, cohort group. This is work around um, South Asian communities, which I think has been really important to mention. And uh, of course, there are non-community related interventions that have a effect on health inequalities. So take the minimum pricing for alcohol is likely to have a stronger effect as a financial disincentive on communities where money you know, is tighter than communities where money is more available. So there are ways of targeting um, more deprived um, communities without necessarily thinking about community-based actions as well. So there are, I think, a few examples. OK, Ash. Good morning. Um, Professor Siotto is very interested to hear more about your direct trial that you've carried out because I think there certainly <coughs> up until recently there was this imagination that you know if you got type 2 diabetes you were kind of stuck with it and we were you know the health service was left with really sort of managing those symptoms and preventing it kind of escalating but you showed through your trial that that actually is not the case and you've got um, extremely good rates of remission can you tell us a little bit more about it please yes so the news is not that um, you can beat diabetes into remission, type 2 diabetes that is, through a dietary intervention, because that has been built up as evidence over a while now. And mm -hmm. of course, all started with a physiological hypothesis that Professor Taylor has put forward. And then we have had this really positive collaboration between the north of England and Scotland in working this through. I think the big news of this um, intervention is that you can potentially scale this effect up mm -hmm. by delivering it in a standard healthcare environment at a rate that um, I suppose really fuels fantasies of, of, of rolling out a service that can provide diabetes remission to a large proportion of the population. And I think that is the great news. So the, the result is quite, quite um, strong in that we understand the physiological mechanisms well and that we previously showed similar effects in smaller studies. Mm -hmm. But we now see that at the level of, of, of a sort of population uh, approach, we reach targets of almost 50% mm. remission. Okay. And so there is clearly an opportunity to adopt this early into policy, but it's also important to note that at this stage, it's a trial, mm -hmm. there's a lot of additional work needed to know what is needed to turn this into policy, but um, this is the opportunity, I, I suppose, for the um, Scottish Parliament to, to work out what these steps are and to mm -hmm. fill the gaps. And so that would be delivered in a primary care setting, so in the community, um, is it in small groups? And I think you're saying here it's um, interventions for about three to five months and then a longer term support. So it's a total meal replacement for three to five months oh, where okay. um, we're looking into, into a balanced um, low energy diet. And I, I suppose for the, for the older ones of us, it's important to note that when these low energy diets first came up, you know, people talked about losing their hair and all those kind of side effects. And that's still somewhere in the back of people's mind. And of course, nowadays, these interventions are so nutritionally ba balanced mm -hmm. that they're probably better than the typical Scottish diet, if I may yeah. say. So, um, <laughs> and, and so, so we have a higher than people expected um, hit rate on getting people through this initial um, period of, of um, adhering to the intervention. And then there's a structured reintroduction of normal food. And then there is a um, structured approach to supporting weight loss maintenance. And together, uh, I think the, the results speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's quite um, effective. And clearly, if you were to roll this out beyond research-interested practices, beyond the people who are joining studies, mm -hmm. some of those main indicators, in particular weight loss percentage of people um, gaining the target of 15% weight loss, or number of people actually experiencing remission, that might be a little bit more variable and might be a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. But given the, I think, enormous power of those findings, you could well afford you know, lower follow-through rates at mm. population levels, as you do always when you translate trial evidence into population services, mm -hmm. and still have um, a very, very cost-effective service, which not only is a sensible thing to do for health services, but it's also something that I think empowers people with type 2 diabetes and 
I know that um, Professor Taylor in England in particular receives a large number of, of messages, emails, letters every day of people telling him how important it is that there is a way yeah. to get off this diagnosis of type yeah. 2 diabetes. Yeah. And of course, I should briefly say we, we have seen similar reversal effects in bariatric surgery in the past. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it isn't a t t total surprise effect where the community wouldn't have thought that would happen. We thought it would happen. We didn't quite appreciate at what level it would happen mm -hmm. and how scalable it would be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the game changer from a policy perspective mm -hmm. here. Okay, thank you. So I asked the previous panel this question as well. So obviously what we've been discussing here is, um, you know, preventative intervention, but at the point where people are already diabetic or targeting high-risk individuals before they cross over. But if we're talking about early prevention, if we're talking about educating people about food choices, about food labeling, advertising to children, fast food, and all those type of things, and that's kind of on the other hand, in terms of the preventative agenda, where would the balance be in the spending? You know, would it be 50-50 between sort of early things to do with food, or would it be, would you spend the money more on the high-risk individuals? How do you see that? Can I, can I please comment on this as well? So I've been um, the principal investigator of the formative evaluation of the first two phases of the English uh, Diabetes Prevention Service as well. So that's an area I'm particularly interested in. What happens if you, if you look into some of the upstream interventions is, of course, that they don't only affect type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. but they affect a range of other things. Of so the question isn't perhaps well perceived because you, you, you can't balance a budget 50-50 when mm -hmm. the target and, and the potential effect of these interventions is quite different. So I, I think the question would be difficult to answer because if you manage to to um, affect the Scottish diet, the, the energy intake, the physical activity environment of the Scottish population, you would see benefits across the board. It would affect um, depression, potentially uh, attainment, productivity. Yeah. So to limit this into the perspective of type 2 diabetes prevention mm -hmm. would be narrow and perhaps undervalue that kind of a part of the approach. Okay. Uh, Lynn, yeah. Um, with regard to the uh, Obesity um, Action Scotland group, we believe that the primary prevention in terms of the prevention of obesity and overweight in our population, um, there's a key opportunity that the Scottish Programme for Government has with regard to the Healthier Future consultation. And indeed, by addressing both the obesogenic environment, so we have that primary prevention to prevent people from becoming obese due to lack of physical activity and overconsumption of nutrient-dense foods, is a key pillar in actually delivering a healthier future. But in addition to that, there are no consistent um, services that actually target type 2 diabetes and the prevention of across Scotland and the publication of the review with regard to weight management services in Scotland in 2014, which is in a paper that you have had cited, also indicates that there's no consistency. So there's a key opportunity in being able to address both the primary prevention of obesity and overweight within our population by introducing the measures that we addressed earlier in the conversation, but also in terms of that targeted intervention for those that are most at risk um, by actually consolidating the weight management services that we currently have available in Scotland. Um, because without obesity, then the chances of 47% of the type 2 diabetes can be attributed to obesity, and as 65% of our population are already regarded as either obese or having or are overweight then the measures around the obesogenic environment are not going to be enough and therefore we do need to think about being able to underpin these core weight management services that will impact not just on the development of type 2 diabetes but also the contribution that obesity then makes in our common cancers and cardi cardiovascular disease. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brian? interested in uh, a couple of points I think that are linked, one by Pete and one by Alison, around <coughs> access to uh, healthier foods and also access to uh, activity. And, and it's, it strikes me that uh, surely the, the, the place where we can, the, the level, or especially around uh, in the more socially economic uh, poor areas, is surely school. Uh, I'm sure we have an opportunity at school to introduce uh, and uh, to the uh, kids to, to healthier food, especially around uh, school meals. And, and following on for that, I, I did a, um, uh, I've met a, f a few of the schools uh, talking about the free school meals and the uptake of free school meals. 
And it transpires even one of the schools was less than 20% of pupils who were eligible to have free school meals actually took them and the rest still chose to leave the playground and go and take, uh, take this high calorie, uh, poor, poor nutritional food. So if we're unable to stop the planning applications, if we're unable to stop vans parking outside the schools, do we need to stop kids leaving the school playground? Uh, and as I said, should we should we be focusing very much on what we can change, which is around the school uh, food environment and school activity environment? I think there is already quite a lot happening in schools <coughs> around the education part. I think kids are, by the time they go through school, they are pretty savvy to what a healthy diet is. It's, they're not ignorant, but knowledge doesn't always translate into action and there are quite strong drivers i guess for young people to go out of school and to experience what is out beyond the school gate and it is an issue it is a problem i think um, whether or not you could keep children all the children in over a lunch period you, it's probably not practical given the size of the schools so the size of the dining room and the shortness of the uh, lunch break. So these these are really big challenges. I think I think school is important. There is currently a review of the standards uh, underway at the moment, and uh, we need to look at how they might become tighter. But I wouldn't place all my eggs in one basket here. Actually, there's no single silver bullet. There's a whole package of measures that need to come together for diet in the Scottish diet to change. And I don't want to dismiss the school angle, but it's not the only one. Um, and I think in terms of other actions around that obesogenic environment, there are many things that may may help to clean that up. And even when the when kids are going out into that environment, it's less, it's less, um, less obesogenic. But we need to see things like price promotions changing. We need to look at um, issues around advertising and marketing to children. Um, we need to think about reformulating the actual food that is out there to take the take some of the salt and fat and sugar out of it, so that you don't have to make that choice. Oh, will I have this or will I have that? Actually, the choice there is better than it was. Um, I think the Board of Food Standards Scotland would also argue that there needs to be taxation measures that go beyond the soft drinks industry levy. I think that uh, the, we, we absolutely agree on the education side around um, public campaigning is, is helpful, but it's not going to answer it all. I think that we have stated that education specifically on diabetes in schools, or, or just generally diabetes, education on diabetes would be useful and somebody was talking about that in the earlier session about going in and talking about the consequences of diabetes because I don't think that's really well understood and I think there is work to be done on addressing the affordability and acceptability of a healthy diet because you know we all know I think most of us here will know what a healthy diet is and what the components are and there are many reasons as to why we don't do it and one of those barriers would be accessibility and affordability for some and I think the other thing that is really important in all of this is the provision of constant, diet, consistent dietary messaging so that we don't get messages from everywhere that are inconsistent and confusing. So, yes, schools are an important focus, but concentrating eggs in one basket there wouldn't be enough. That. Sorry? I wasn't no, sorry, that. Well, sorry if I picked yeah. that up. Can I say as part of the prevention framework, we're looking at a kind of birth to the end of your life kind of approach to this. And I think one of the things we've identified is that we need to look at pregnancy, we need to look at breastfeeding, then weaning, and there's been a big health visitor review and how health visiting is delivered in Scotland is changing just now as well. We're introducing kind of dip more screening of weight and height, which previously wasn't done for large gaps. We're trying to look at working with mothers who are overweight during pregnancy and trying to get them into weight management programs once they've had their babies to try and prevent further weight gain in between pregnancies, provide 
pre-diabetes support for those women who do have gestational diabetes, because we know they're a high-risk group as well, trying to encourage breastfeeding and encouraging healthy weaning, because usually by the time children do get to five, the kind of healthy eating habits are almost ingrained, and we're trying to encourage that it's a family approach as opposed to individuals rather than therapeutic. It's, and again, in terms of the behaviours around eating, they're learned behaviours from the family home, which we're trying to influence from every stage. So that's a big part of the work we're doing is the maternal and infant nutrition strand of things as well, to try and go from that, from that even that earlier stage, even from pregnancy, and to try and give guidance pre-pregnancy as well about health eating, about weight management, and about the importance of pre preventing diabetes. Uh, Pete, yeah? yeah just, I think it's absolutely right. We, we, we did change the alcohol environment, we did change the tobacco environment, and we can change the food environment. And I think we have to take it very seriously. As you say, it has good effects across the board, not just on diabetes. And we need to let nutrition do the heavy lifting here. And we, we know that, for example, the, the, the volume of fruit, of veg we buy in Scotland from the supermarkets is about a third of what it should be if we were going to have a balanced diet. We know that it's much lower for out of home. The, the companies which provide our food environment, which create our food environment, are creating a food environment which is not what we need to eat according to our dietary targets. So we need to change what they provide, not necessarily individual products, but the basket of what's provided needs to be changed. Otherwise, we can't eat healthy with the exception of, of breastfeeding. You know, we, we depend on the food industry to deliver our food environment, and we need to change what it delivers if we want a better food environment for all of us to grow up in. OK, uh, I've got Jenny and Ivan on these specific issues, yeah? Convener, just as a brief supplementary to Brian Whittle's point, um, I appreciate what you said, Heather, piece with regard to um, it not just being about school meals. However, for a growing number of children in Scotland, that free school meal might be the only meal they have all day. Um, I therefore wonder, has any research been conducted with regard to the nutritional content of school meals in Scotland? Because in my experience, uh, as a, a former teacher, it varies across the country what kids are offered. Sure, you're right that it varies across the country. What there are at the moment in, in place are standards for school meals that are in legislation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what I can't answer is exactly how well those standards are being met. But I would, you know, anecdotally, I think the answer is probably it varies across the country. So some, some schools and areas will be doing really well against those standards mm -hmm. and others may not be. Mm -hmm. um, it's important that the, I think the, the free school meal is extremely important. I accept the point that it may be the only meal that that child gets, and therefore the standard of that meal is important. Yeah. So I would not, uh, I'd not go say anything other than that, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. The, the school meal um, regulations are currently under review. They were done last in 2007 8. And since then, there have been a number of different recommendations, evidence based recommendations on diet and health. For example, to reduce sugar content and to of the diet and increase fibre, for example, mm -hmm. um, as well as looking at the role of uh, red meat on colorectal cancer risk. So there's all that that has happened in terms of advice since the since the regulations were were set. Um, so that's. Thanks, and uh, thanks, panel. Um, it was something that Heather Peace said, and also something that, that Pete Ritchie said earlier as well, around about um, the relative costs of um, good foods and bad foods, if you like, that the, the, the good foods are more expensive in general. Uh, and, and you mentioned um, taxation policy, perhaps. So I suppose I just wanted to explore um, what you would propose in that space, either taxation or and or subsidy, um, and any examples of other countries that, that have done that, bearing in mind that the cost of diabetes to the health service is probably around about a billion pound a year. So if we get this right, there, there's money there to, to, to support initiatives. So I don't know what your, your thoughts are on that. Well, the example at the moment that's current is the UK government's uh, soft drinks industry levy, which will come in to play in April, I think, next year. However, in advance of that being the case, the soft drinks industry have really removed a lot of sugar from their drinks. It's, it's, it's done that reformulation thing, which we need to see. Our problem, and I think that's great, we do need to see that, and I think also that is a, 
it's almost a totemic measure to say enough's enough that you don't need to put that amount of sugar into any of your products, take it out, please. So I think that's really important. However, what we see in monitoring the diet overall, that that same amount of sugar isn't removed from the whole diet. So some of it must be going back into other products. So, you know, do we need to start to th think about other products that are that, that they're sitting below the soft drinks industry. The obvious one would be confectionery, for example, which is taking a lot of sugar and is completely discretionary in the diet. We all like it, and particularly at this time of year, but actually we don't need it. So there's a lot of that kind of food in the diet that, that, that could have scope for, for taxation to improve diet. Um, I think in addition to that, the tackling the regulation to tackle price promotions for the high fat, high sugar, energy dense foods that are particularly drawn to people whose budget perhaps is limited in terms of buying nutrient dense foods. Um, so we certainly think that's an action and a key opportunity within the um, healthier future strategy that's currently out for consultation. Um, and in addition to that, the, uh, the wider impact of reformulating key products, um, because we consistently miss our targets as a nation in terms of our intake of saturated fat and free sugars. So in particularly impacting on, on the diet of children, if we were able to reformulate some of the high consumption foods, even if we were to reduce the sugar intake by 50% in key products, we would therefore be able to lower the sugar intake for around 12% um, in 9% in adults and from 15 to 10% in children. So we think that reformulation of reducing the sugar content of key foods that are available in our, in our um, supermarkets and also increasing fibre and reducing saturated fat would actually have a significant impact on the, the dietary goals that people are achieving. Related, there is uh, evidence for legislation on advertisement being effective, in particular advertisement of high energy dense food um, for children in children programs. So there has already been legislation in the UK and there is good evidence that there has been successful in terms of um, decreasing the popularity of certain food options. And subsidies for foods that are good for you? I think there's good argument for increasing the availability of free vegetables, particularly for children. Um, I, I can't see why you wouldn't do that and make that easier for children. <coughs> Obviously, you've got the issue of targeting. It's a universal benefit then if you do it for all children. But I think actually increasing vegetable intake is, is one of the things you can do that would be actually very helpful. We've been running a voluntary initiative with the major retailers in the UK, and we've got over 50% of them signed up to increasing their vegetable sales. But I think all voluntary initiatives suffer from a problem that they, they can lose traction after a time. So we would argue in the Food Coalition for raising the bar continually on regulation and expecting our multiple retailers and particularly the out-of-home environment to reach, reach some minimum standards in terms of both you know, the lack of the, the high, high fat, sugar and salt stuff, but also the positive presence of whole grains and, and fiber in the food. So you just make it harder for anybody just to set up and open a food outlet and sell whatever they want. I think um, it's, you know, it's vital to our health. And it's a very under-regulated thing at the margins of anybody can set up and, and you know, sell stuff which is not very good for our health. Yeah, thank you. We did, of course, have free fruit in schools previously, but that's <coughs> gone by the wayside. Um, sorry, Heather, very briefly, and then I'll bring in Alison. We've done a little bit of consumer work, and certainly the idea of taxation coupled with subsidy is quite popular. Alison. Thank you, convener. I think I'll direct my, my question in the first instance to Pete Ritchie. The Scottish Food Coalition, in your evidence, um, you're asked, well, all, all asked, um, to what extent you believe the Scottish Government's Diabetes Improvement Plan and the approach by integration and, and authorities and NHS boards is preventative. And the Scottish Food Coalition say that, the, the, um, that it's entirely focused on the quality of individual treatment and care. This is not a prevention strategy and makes no mention of diet and other lifestyle factors. Um, so you're quite critical of that. And also, um, you're pointing out that there's no global analysis on the balance of government spending between prevention and treatment of, of, of ill health. Um, so they're fairly critical and direct comments. But you do 
think there is hope. Um, you think the healthier future document is much clearer, and you're also of the opinion that the Good Food Nation agenda has real potential for change. I just wonder, what you know, had, does the Good Food Nation have the power to counteract what's not happening in other areas? In, in our view, over a generation it probably does. But we have to take what we describe in our evidence as a whole of society and a whole of government approach. You know, this isn't just about diabetes and it isn't just about sugar. It is about what sort of a country we want to be and how healthy do, our, do we want our population to be. And if we want to live in a country where, you know, we're not just marginally less unwell, but we're actively brimming with health as a population, then we have to change a lot of things about how we organise our society. And, you know, congestion charging is probably as important as, as sugar tax reduction. I mean, as all those things go together if we want to make a society where we're healthy and things Brian talks about in terms of changing the way we do things in schools, you know, what you've done on, on, on active lifestyles. It's all part of a piece, but we have to be serious about wanting to make radical change. And in criticising the strategy, I'm afraid all I could do was read what was written on the page in terms of the, the words that were said, and I'm sure that colleagues in, who are working in the field are very focused on, on, on prevention and very keen to see prevention, but the strategy itself didn't spell that out and didn't allocate resources for primary prevention, i.e. changing the food environment, which, as Obesity Action Scotland say, is the thing that's driving a lot of people in Scotland and worldwide towards type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. I was um, horrified to, to hear your comments around Just Eat um, when you opened, and I think previously met with Professor Charles Milne, and uh, I, th I think that was a, it was a discussion with the FSA at that point, and he pointed out, and I, I questioned this figure, but he thought that potentially up to 15% of Scottish households didn't actually have cutlery, um, which, which was a statistic, you know, you, you can almost understand why that might be happening now, given the access to, you know, to eating outside and so on. But, you know, we seem to have two different cultures. We're known globally for the quality of produce um, in Scotland, but we seem to be buying, serving and eating markedly different um, produce. How do we go about changing that? And also you've got the challenges of, you know, more and more people now relying on what is provided for them at food banks and so on. You know, how do we ensure that those people are getting anything like the amount of fibre they need on a daily basis? Okay, well, I, um, we, have to, we have to make improving nutrition, as I said, a goal not just the health committee, but across government. Um, at, at, you know, the most senior level in government, it has to be seen as a whole government thing. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, it has to start, you know, pre-birth. That's when it starts in the first thousand days. And we have to re-engineer, if you like, the whole way that we, we get food to people. We're not going to go back to a time where everybody's going to grow their own vegetables or even everybody's going to go home and cook seven days a week. We're not going to go back to that. Um, but we do, we can ensure that even if you are getting something from a takeaway, that it's got the right stuff in it. You know, and at the moment, if you go to a takeaway, you can get something very cheap that's immediately filling for 99p, or you can spend £3.50 on some quinoa and salad. Now, if you're hungry, you buy the stuff that fills you up for 99p, and, you know, whatever your income is. And at the moment, we're, so we have to change the food environment so that, you know, eating stuff which is good for our health is as cheap or cheaper than eating stuff which isn't so good for our health, but also changing the whole way in which we, our culture looks at eating opportunities. And we've crammed so many more eating opportunities into our days and into our lives. It's very hard for people to just go, well, I'm not gonna eat anything now. And it relies on people having huge amounts of sort of self-discipline and, and motivation to do that. Um, so we need to change how easy it is for us to just fill up on stuff all the time. You know, we didn't have food in garages when I was growing up. Now you can't get through a petrol station without being asked to buy more food that you don't need. So I, I do, you know, I'm not wanting to sound puritanical about this, but if we want to have a healthier society, we need to do something about our relationship with, with food. And part of that is regulating the food environment, just like we've regulated other environments. Um, Miles. Thank you for being here. Good morning to the panel. Um, some of the GPs we've had um, <clears throat> giving evidence to the committee have said they're not comfortable about speaking about weight with patients. And one of the specific areas I'd asked in the past was around social prescribing. 
and actually looking towards where people can go. And I was just interested to, um, to hear from the panel their views on how that should be developed, specifically maybe with regards to the use of private weight management companies like Weight Watchers and others, um, to be able to use that capacity which is out in the country, which is maybe not being utilised. All right. Um, in NHS Lothian, when we got a small amount of money to provide our weight management service, we looked at what was available and Greater Glasgow and Clyde had gone out to tender and got Weight Watchers. But the Weight Watchers aspect of it is about making money through people losing weight and it doesn't involve the behaviour change aspect of things, it doesn't involve the physical activity side. So we then were able to provide for a cheaper price a service that we did in unison with the communities with health and social care. We use an evidence-based model, we trained our colleagues in the leisure centres who were trained to reps level four in terms of physical activity and we mentor them and support them and we see ourselves as a wider team. So we've then provided across all of Lothian a service which is a tiered model of care which enables patients to access wherever they are and to have subsidised physical activity, etc., rather than go down the kind of commercial route, which actually at the end of the day is promoting Weight Watchers locality chocolate bars, etc., which is not the message. Um, and I, I do think in terms of funding for weight management services, if we can roll it out in that way and use what we've got and work together, then it can be done economically rather than the presumption that it would be cheaper to go out to tender because then we've got qualified professional staff at the different levels providing it. We've certainly encouraged self-management. We've tried to go into the communities. We've done specific groups for carers who find it difficult to access groups otherwise. Um, we've provided specialist swimming lessons for, not swimming, not swimming lessons, swimming classes for um, Asian women's groups that they need to attend privately, etc. So I do think going into the communities and seeing what is available and providing services that are going to suit everyone is better than going down the commercial route. So perhaps I should say that I have no interest to declare, but I think the wider evidence um, perhaps draws a slightly different picture. So there are trials of weight management um, services and they show consistently that the commercial providers do as good or usually better than, than any NHS related providers. So that's quite strong evidence. And there's a specific trial and I apologize if I give you an example from south of the from north of the border south of the border in this case, sorry. Um, there's a, a trial showing that um, a simple referral into a commercial weight management program that takes a GP less than 30 seconds published in the, in the Lancet this year by the Oxford group uh, led by Paul Aviard, results in spectacular effects on, on weight over a year. Um, they asked actually patients whether they found it was appropriate to be referred to by the GP. They found it rather uh, effective. So I think it's a, it's a more measured ap approach. There is good evidence to suggest that commercial providers have something to offer in that picture and that the health economics of it un aren't necessarily unfavorable and there are uh, effective and proven methods of referring people from primary care services into weight management provision. So I, I, I think that it's worth looking at it from different angles and consider the local and the global implications of, of decisions. <coughs> You said you had no de declaration to make it. There's not, none of the research you've been involved in has been associated with any of these companies. That's fine, thank you. I think probably for a lot of people with commercial programmes, they might want to go and they might have the means to go and it might be prescribed. But certainly within our weight management service, something like 40% of the patients we see have underlying disordered eating patterns who are morbidly obese, certainly. And usually they need psychological input prior to embarking on weight management. So we've found huge success in doing quite extensive screening with our very complex patients. I think for patients with possibly mild to moderate obesity, then pot potentially the commercial might have a place if that's something they're motivated to do. But I think in terms of even if I think about our population in Lothian, we have huge comorbidities. Our average comorbidity for our tier four is four comorbidities. Our, pre, our lower um, tier, which we had initially thought would be more preventative, there's an average of three comorbidities in that group, and there's usually quite a lot of mental health, self-esteem, depression issues, which need to be tackled and need to be aided prior to weight management. And I think that's the assumption. We always think if we just give you weight management, you'll lose weight. But there's so many other things that need to be kind of dealt with from a healthcare environment as well. And I do think motivated people might do well from it. But I think as, as healthcare, there's, there's much more issues as well.
We've got to bring Lynn in, but we're running really, really short of time, so I need everybody to be really, very um, brief with their answers. It's really just to pick up on that point and to say that um, the Diabetes Improvement Plan was obviously published in 2014, and there's no consistent approach yet to the prevention of diabetes across Scotland. And the evidence that has been submitted for your information around weight management services also shows that there's no consistency in the weight management services. However, there is evidence that these existing services are hugely underutilised for the secondary prevention of diabetes in the obese population. So I guess there's a huge opportunity with the primary care modernisation, with what we know about what is effective in terms of evidence base around tiered work management and the recent evidence around targeted um, prevention of type 2 diabetes to actually raise the bar in terms of the services that we currently have to be able to achieve a consistent um, service level that would achieve these outcomes that relate to what GPs can refer into. Very, very very to what extent do you think there's also a divide within urban and rural uh, provision? Um, the committee actually, some of the committee members went up to Avi Moore um, on a visit to look at the community um, sports hub there and part of that was actually trying to build facilities um, to overlap for people, so putting their kids into a, a group but then if their weight management group starting 15 minutes later so they could attend. Do you think there's work going on like that in Scotland? Across Scotland? I, um, I can only comment, I, I know that there is exactly in terms of the new builds, in terms of in Midlothian, for example, the co-location of um, buildings in terms of using the new school alongside the new health centre as a hub in terms of being able to do exactly that type of intervention. Um, and I know in terms of the lo locality planning groups are looking at exactly that in relation to what their population needs are so that they can co-locate services and integrate to achieve maximum benefit with the resources that they have. Okay. Two people, um, just a bit, we need to be very quick on us, Brian and then Emma. No, I'm okay. Emma, good. That was very quick. Um, we're having this discussion today and there's already a government consultation going on right now looking at that. And I'm sure you'll all be feeding into the consultation. But it sounds as if, you know, there is a, a, a consensus of a bit of disparity out there of how people are joined up or not. And I'm hearing about allotments locally. I'm hearing about local planting of veg, engaging wains, planting apple trees. So there's stuff going on out there that obviously will be all brought together. And the Fixing Dad programme, which we heard about at the Cross Party Group for Diabetes last week, where a family intervention um, engaged in a man to lose seven stone, and now he's off all his diabetes meds. So there's stuff going on out there, and I'm sure the the consultation will feed into that, but just your quick brief thoughts on the consultation and the process. The consultation is out uh, due to be completed at the end of January and there's been consultation events to try and get more people involved with re responding to it. One of the things the diabetes, Scottish Diabetes Group is trying, is almost we're trying to make sure that we marry up very well with the consultation and that's why in terms of the prevention subgroup we've involved a lot of obesity and public health people in that diabetes prevention group which formerly as part of the Scottish Diabetes Group was just diabetes people so once the consultation is published and we see what the results have got we're then going to make sure that the diabetes prevention framework sits well with that. There's a significant amount of money being pledged to try and implement the results of that and I think the big a big thing was to make sure that diabetes prevention was kind of throughout it again from pregnancy right through so I think in terms of the time scales of that we are going to get it is going to be finished at the end of January and then we're going to try and move as quickly as possible with that because there is a lot of good work being done and certainly you mentioned Miles about the rural um, Argyll and Butte are doing a lot of great work Asia and Aaron are doing great work I've been working with them as part of my and I think we are trying to look at different issues in different areas but again try to be providing evidence-based approaches to what is going to work rather than one fact size fits all. Uh, just very briefly, I suppose our response as a food coalition is that we would always emphasise focusing on the environment, making it easier for people to eat more veg, eat less sugar, make it easier for people, change the environment and don't concentrate too much on educating individuals. We've done a lot of that and I think we need, now need to change the environment. 
really also just like to reinforce the, from our perspective, very much around the obesogenic environment, but also tackling the inequalities that result and lead to obesity and type 2 diabetes and making sure that the, um, from a sustainability and value perspective, that the resources that are pledged within um, the healthier future are actually an evidence-based intervention in terms of both weight management services, but also targeted intervention for, di for prevention of diabetes. Heather. I think our board, the Food Standards Scotland board, will be making a response to the, the consultation, and it's for them really to, to do that. But I think just to make the point that the, consulta the, the content of that consultation has relied quite a lot upon the evidence from Food Standards Scotland around the diet and, um, and other aspects, but also that we're very pleased, I think, that the food environment has been single you know is a, is a strong part of of the consultation for exactly the the reasons others have said and um these are, to a large extent in line with the proposals that food standards scotland made to scottish ministers back in, tw in january 2016. okay thanks um on the um, prevention um the, the, the evidence suggests that the issues are around age gender um, genes and ethnicity and weight management. Well, sadly, we can't do much about the ageing process. I really wish we could, but uh, um, there's limited impact we can do have on gender, genetics and ethnicity. So clearly, weight management is the focus. And uh, I'm sure we all hope that out of the two strategies that are coming forward that we see uh, you know, significant practical actions that are going to uh, address this because this, the potential impact of having a, a really proactive preventative agenda is massive for the health and social care budget in Scotland, but also for the uh, health and well-being of people. So thank you very much for your attendance uh, uh, today, and um, we'll just, uh, we now move into private session. Sorry.